It's January 2019, and I'm in Puerto Rico. It's early evening, and a large crowd have gathered, excited to be a part of one of the island's most anticipated nights for decades. Elegant-looking women are smiling, their diamonds glistening as camera flashes catch their light. TV crews jockey for position, eager to capture the moment, and I begin to recognize celebrity after celebrity, mingling with politicians and other dignitaries alike. Bells start to ring in the distance, a sign that the evening's entertainment is about to commence, and suddenly, I'm nervous. Years of preparation have gone into tonight. I make my way through the crowd and into the auditorium. I take my seat, right in front of the stage, dead center. I have the best seat in the house. I'm the music director and conductor. We play the opening notes, and the 2,000-strong crowd erupts with screams so loud, the building actually shakes. Hamilton the musical is finally here. When Lin-Manuel Miranda, the show's creator and leading man for the evening, first appears on stage, the noise is so deafening, we have to hold the show for over a minute to allow the crowd time to calm down. After what feels like eternity, we start the show again, and I spend the next few minutes grinning from ear to ear, acutely aware that the last 25 years of complete dedication to my craft has all been leading to this moment. And then I feel it, the familiar feeling of pain. It starts as a tingling sensation in the neck on the right side and becomes a dull ache as it moves through the shoulder and down the arm. By the time it reaches my forearm, it's not a dull ache anymore. It's an intense stabbing pain that reaches into the wrist and the thumb. The more we play, the worse the pain gets. My brain is screaming, don't think about it. Think about the notes. Think about every note. You remember your responsibilities, don't you? This is Hamilton, for goodness sake. It has to be right, it has to be exact. It has to be perfect. That was the last time I ever conducted Hamilton. I realized that night that I finally needed to admit defeat after eight months of working through a repetitive strain injury and quit the show. Since leaving Hamilton, I've realized that the pursuit of perfection, my need to create art, not just music every night, played a supporting role in the injury. I've discovered that my perfectionism started in childhood and has been a significant component of my life in general, the positive aspects of it rewarding me with a hugely successful career. But the negative parts, the loud and bullying inner critic and low self-esteem, difficult to deal with. I'm not alone. Perfectionism affects many of us the world over. And studies by Curran and Hill in 2016 and the World Health Organization in 2017 show that perfectionism in young people and depression are on the rise. Society is demanding perfection now more than ever, but we're struggling to manage it, unable to meet its call in healthy ways because we don't have the tools to do so. Outdated methods to manage our perfectionism ultimately set us up to fail, and we deserve better. A radical rethink in how perfectionism is portrayed and managed is vital for the perfectionists of tomorrow. Celebrating perfectionism is our promise to the future. Research by psychologists Beeling, Israeli, and Anthony suggests that perfectionism comes in two forms, adaptive and maladaptive, positive and negative perfectionism. Perfectionists normally display a combination of both adaptive and maladaptive thoughts and behaviors. And until now, one of the most popular ways to manage perfectionism has been to encourage the recalibration of standards to promote the thought that perfection doesn't exist, and so we should embrace excellence as a more realistic and healthier target. Perfectionists hate the word excellence. It's like you're sending us out to win bronze 
at the Olympics. <laughs> this new standard of excellence affects us all in a negative way. Perfectionists are unable to realize their true potential, and we are prevented from enjoying the results produced by the pursuit of their very best. There is a different approach to the management of perfectionism that allows us all to benefit. Now, to help explain what this method might be, I'd like to tell you the story of Captain Perfection, a superhero striving for flawlessness and the setting of high performance standards. He's achieved some pretty remarkable things in life, at work, with family, and in the community, and recently attributed all of his success to adaptive perfectionism, an omnipresent positive influence. From the outside, life is pretty incredible, but beneath the mask of awesomeness lies a dark secret. Our superhero is regularly visited by maladaptive perfectionism, adaptive's evil twin, who regularly infiltrates CP's brain with instructions to work harder and be even more perfect. Our superhero struggles to find equilibrium between the twins, and recently, maladaptive has begun to gain more influence. Captain Perfection staying at work late to make projects even more perfect. He's missing football practice and nights out with his family because work has to come first. And he started having big arguments with Adaptive. Before he knows it, things get even worse. Maladaptive starts showing up with his partner in crime, depression. They prove to be a lethal double act and our superhero struggles to sleep and his work starts to suffer. Eventually, Captain Perfection's depression gets so bad, his boss tells him he needs to take some time off to figure out how to get back to being the real Captain Perfection. In looking for a solution, CP realizes that he should be able to get rid of depression by first getting rid of maladaptive. He learns that one of the most popular ways to get rid of maladaptive was to lower the expectations of perfection and accept excellence instead. Our superhero really isn't sure about this and tries to imagine what life might be like as Captain Excellence. <laughs> it's not a good look, right? <laughs> the next day, he strikes gold. He comes across a study written by a team in Australia in 2018 saying that changing his relationship with maladaptive was the answer. He learns that the introduction of self-compassion would reduce the strength of relationship between maladaptive and depression, meaning he would get to see much less of depression, perhaps never seeing him again. Captain Perfection suddenly understood that he needed to go and find Dr. Kindness. Now, Dr. Kindness is a wise old man. Of course he is. And he goes about introducing Captain Perfection to self-compassion. They practice meditation and other mindfulness activities to focus the mind and establish a new and kinder inner dialogue that enables CP's perfectionism to become even more streamlined and effective. They work hard, well into the night, but eventually our superhero returns home exhausted but happy with a revitalized set of superpowers charged with self-compassion. The next day, Captain Perfection goes back to work, and he's thrilled to find Adaptive there waiting for him. They attack the day's tasks together when suddenly, Maladaptive appears. This is nowhere near as good as it could be. Work harder. Captain Perfection knows exactly what he needs to say. Hello, Maladaptive. I've been expecting you. I've decided I don't want to see depression anymore, so from now on, our relationship is going to be different. From today, everything I do will be fueled by self-compassion, which means you will no longer be able to trick me into thinking that I'm not enough or that I should be working harder to be even more perfect. From today, you don't control me, I control you. Maladaptive at once knew that his powers over Captain Perfection had been diminished drastically and that he would need to say goodbye to depression. He realized that his life would now be a very different place, and he slumped in a dark corner, completely deflated. Depression was never seen again. Captain Perfection remained true to his word to Dr. Kindness, that he would practice self-compassion every day, 
which helped keep maladaptive at bay. He began to spend even more time with adaptive, achieving even more remarkable accomplishments. And his town, team, boss and family continue to celebrate his adaptive perfectionism every day. As Captain Perfection just showed us, the introduction of self-compassion in our pursuit of perfection is a game changer. It allows us to be the best we can be in healthy ways with no compromise to the standards that we hold. It not only enables us to reduce our experiences with maladaptive perfectionism and depression, it actually makes us more productive. When we're compassionate, the parasympathetic nervous system, the part that calms us down, switches on, which leads to higher creativity. More blood flows to the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that does most of our thinking. And a hormone called oxytocin flows more freely, enabling us to better manage our levels of stress. Now, the introduction of self-compassion is not easy, and it takes time. But small changes to our outlook can produce incredible results. Speaking to ourselves compassionately forces the inner critic to be less present, leaving us free to fully focus on the tasks at hand. That same language encourages us to embrace forgiveness, celebrating what we achieve, not berating what we don't, and inspires us to believe that prioritizing our perfectionism is a healthier approach. Self-compassion teaches us that we are worthy, that there is no need to compare ourselves to others because what we have inside us is enough, that each of us in our own way are all Captain Perfection with superpowers that deserve to shine. Self-compassion is a powerful weapon in the fight to manage perfectionism, but that's only half the battle. We need your help. We need society to believe that the standards we hold for ourselves and for others are worthy of celebration, that we deserve more than the recalibration of standards because what we achieve in our pursuits of perfection delivers too much to let go. We need employers to recognize that what is achieved in those pursuits is often the standard that beats the competition we deserve to be proud, not ashamed of our perfectionism in the workplace. Above all, we need encouragement. Encouragement to understand our perfectionism early in our lives so we are free to get out of our own way sooner to realize our true potential. Had I known much of what I know now about perfectionism when I was a child, things might have worked out quite differently. So what might I now say to my younger self when it first started to surface? Dear Julian, you don't know this yet, but you're a perfectionist. You're someone that will want to do better in everything you do, which is a wonderful trait. You won't settle for good enough, and you will lead and inspire others with that thinking. But it's not all good. Throughout your life, you will be incredibly hard on yourself, which will be difficult to deal with. You will struggle with low self-esteem, and the critic in your head will be relentless. But if you act now, if you study perfectionism, read about it, and come to understand that self-compassion can help you with your constant demands for more, you can be happy. You will learn that by being kind to yourself, you can love and accept who you are. Living with perfectionism, achieving accomplishments you can be proud of. Celebrate your perfectionism. Who knows? Maybe one day you'll get to conduct one of the world's biggest musicals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.